You are in the study with Pastor John and Pastor Matt. Tonight we're in Luke 22, 14 to 23. And also, Lord willing, we have time for this. I want us to look at verses 39 to 46 also. And uh, there are some other fun cross-references we'll get to within the study. But the Last Supper, uh, looking at this as the last Passover, but the first Lord's Supper, Luke 22, 14 to 23. Okay. Are we ready for this? Luke 22, 14 to 23. Let me read the text first, and then we'll go back through it. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, that's Jesus, and the apostles with him. As I read that, you probably picture a, a famous painting of Jesus reclining at the table with the apostles. Verse 15, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It comes right up to the surface right away. He was really, really looking forward to this. This is a, um, I wouldn't call it a turning point, but this is a high point. This is a very important moment. Verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat it uh, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this, divide it among yourselves. <clears throat> for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus is always talking about the kingdom of God. Here again is another passage already twice. This issue of the kingdom of God comes up. And it's, again, here it's specifically has in view that that final kingdom, that yeah. full expression of the kingdom in the age to come. Uh, verse 19, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. It's very important. He gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you. Uh, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. So the traitor could not have been any closer. Verse 22, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Uh, first, let's talk about verses 14 and 15. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So two, two key words I want us to look at and think about is, uh, well, one is a word, the other is a phrase. One is Passover. This is a Passover supper. And the other phrase is uh, before I suffer, before I suffer. And so immediately, uh, this is a meal that's looking backward to the Passover. Yeah. And it's looking forward to his suffering. Jesus longed to share this meal with his disciples. He was eager and yearned to celebrate this meal with them because of what it represented. Looking back to the great redemption of the Old Testament, the Exodus from Egypt, and looking forward to what he's about to do in achieving the great redemption of the New Testament, redemption in his blood. And that redemption, the redemption in his blood, fulfills what that what that old covenant redemption predicted and prefigured and foreshadowed. And so this is a Passover that's looking back to what it's going to fulfill and looking forward to what he is about to do. Yes, yeah, so so when we think Passover and when we think of looking back to that time, it's natural to think of um the great redemption being getting through the Red Sea. And 
yeah, that, that is a part of it that they looked back to and celebrated. But the real escape was from the death angel that night. And I know you're going to talk about how they applied the blood. But just remember that Passover goes back to that event in Egypt before the Red Sea uh, to escaping God's death angel. They had to do that before they would uh, escape the Egyptian army. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I did not apportion uh, a specific section to that tonight for two reasons. One, knowing that it would come up. but but. Uh, Two week, I think it was two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I did a Monday morning devotion on that very thing. And yeah. we spent 15 to 20 minutes looking at what does it mean that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin That's of the right. world. And we, right. and we did spend anywhere from you know six to, to nine minutes in Exodus uh, 12 looking at the blood of the Lamb. It's the blood of the Lamb that w- was shed and was uh, spread, smeared around the door that s- saved them from that 10th plague. Uh, right. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, okay, so Passover and before I suffer. So it's looking back to what it's going to fulfill, and it's looking forward to what he's going to do. Verses 16 through 18. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So there's a certain, I'll say it this way, feast. There's a certain future kingdom banquet feast at table with christ and his people um that jesus is looking forward to until that time comes um he will not feast again with him there's something that has to happen there's many things that have to happen first in between this meal and that final meal but so that's so this is future looking now, in even a greater sense than what he's about to suffer, this is future looking at the eternal kingdom. I want to say two quick things on this, and then um, uh, I am guessing you want to say something about this kingdom, but that's just my guess. You, you, uh, Jesus, see what you say. <laughs> this is a cup that Jesus shares with the disciples. In other words, it's not only given to them, but he partakes of it. And up to this point, he's sharing and feasting with them. And as I said, he will not share a cup again or the meal again uh, with them uh, again till his return, that eternal kingdom. But I, but I do want to highlight and really point this up here that he's sharing this together with the disciples. So the phrase, the kingdom of God in both verses 16 and 17, and, and the idea of fulfilled in the kingdom of God, I, th- I think just to point out when that is, where that is, what that is, uh, the word fulfilled, I think, gives us a clue that we're talking about the completion yeah. of our redemption. So it's not just the cross and resurrection. I, I think we're looking forward to the time of of Christ's return and the time when we have redeemed bodies Amen. and can feast with him again, whatever that will be like. But um, again, in verse 18, until the kingdom uh, of God comes. And so I, I look at that and, and uh, believe we should interpret it as the earthly kingdom of God when he returns. That certainly was uh, Paul's understanding. I was looking at a cross-reference, which we think are fun and love them. But as, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yeah. And so yeah. the idea of his coming again, and we we are to yearn for this and to pray for this. John in Revelation 22 and verse 20, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, that's one of the things that I personally am always thinking about, that we're doing this as his church until he comes, Mm -hmm. and there's an ache for his coming. We are looking back. We'll talk more about that. We are looking back and remembering, but we are looking forward and anticipating as well. Yeah, because um, when you look back and remember, 
um, we're remembering <laughs> we're remembering his, his ministry his death his resurrection and what that achieved and so we look forward yeah. for the full yeah, inheritance exactly. of what he achieved exactly. that those two things go together um, it's it's um, going back to this phrase in verse 15 where Jesus says I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover something you said uh, that you, when you read from first uh, Corinthians made me think of that this he had this spirit earnestly looking forward to that meal and that is the spirit that we should have in the church earnestly looking forward to this meal when he returns we long for his return it's um, it should be in our prayers it should be in our minds uh, it should be in our hearts definitely oh, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say on um, verses 16 through 18 I think we covered well we didn't cover everything but I think we, I think we hit the main things there um, he shares this cup with them take it and divide it among yourselves okay now verse 19 verse 19 now we get into specifically the things that become the foundation uh, but not only the foundation but just the, the substance of the Lord's Supper that we celebrate verse 19 and he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, <clears throat> which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, so three things that he did. He took the bread and gave thanks. I guess that's really two things, but I see those as happening together. Right? He took the bread and gave thanks. Uh, the second thing he did is he broke it. He broke it. It is not just when you celebrate the Lord's Supper, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together as a gathered body of Christ, which is how it is meant to be celebrated. Um, it is not just through the bread that we're remembering Jesus. It's through the breaking of the bread. The, uh, he took the bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them. He distributed it to them. That is so important. This he's not sharing together with them. He's giving this to them. His death, which is being symbolized here, is for them. His death is for his people. It's to achieve a salvation, not for himself, but for them. So to symbolize that with this metaphor, this is my body. He took the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to them. It's a perfect imagery. Of the gospel and it is it's a visual proclamation of the gospel the body of Christ broken given to sinners for their salvation and um, uh, pass it over to you pastor to make some comments on this if you'd like while while he's doing that let's get back into Exodus 12 flip let's flip back to Exodus 12 so <clears throat> this is my body we, we understand um, denominations that take or a denomination that takes that literally and of course nothing here should be taken as he's giving some of his body making it bread and no it, it's obviously representing and um, one way that that's supported in the text is the idea of remembering him this is something to be done to remember him not to make him suffer over and over and over again. And I'm speaking, of course, of the Roman Catholic tradition there. But to say this is a representation, the bread represents something very special, uh, the giving of his body, the breaking of his body on the cross, given for you. Can I say something about that? Yes, please. You know, not that you didn't. Yes. You know, for you is so significant in verse 19. For you is in sacrificial death he's picturing what he would do for you is as a propitiation as an yes. offering that satisfies the wrath of god for sin he didn't need to do that for himself he is giving it for you for us uh it's a substitutionary sacrifice it is for our sin so i think jesus words there are deliberate and full of meaning uh, this is this represents my body which is given for you and do this in remembrance of me i think a great way to think about the lord's supper is it is a 
It is a memorial. It is an act of worship and a time of worship. And it is a time where we sense the presence of the Spirit, I think, in a special way in, in, the, in the life of the church. But it is a memorial. We are remembering uh, something uh, crucial uh, of the utmost importance, and that is uh, the cross of Christ and because of that, uh, the coming kingdom. We're remembering both. So as Jews remembered escaping the death angel and exodus out of Egypt, we remember the cross and escaping yeah. the wrath of God yeah. through the blood of Christ. I'll pick up on uh, just what you were saying, because I had three words that I was going to ask you just to write down anywhere, Bible, notepad, on your on your hand, wherever. Just these three words, just write down. Um, one was substitute. Okay. Pastor John said it. Uh, the other was propitiation, yeah. which he also said that. Did I make you jump ahead? I'm sorry. No. This the whole met. We just talk about this and nothing else. This yeah. is it. This is the gospel. Um, th this these are the words that capture the the meaning of the cross. Really, uh, there's so much you can say about the meaning of the cross, but these really capture it. Substitute, propitiation, and atonement. Amen. Atonement. It's an atoning sacrifice. That's pretty much synonymous with propitiation. But Jesus is a substitute. He's dying um, in the place of his people, receiving receiving our wrath. All those who would come to him by faith. It's a it's a propitiation. It's a a sacrifice that turns away wrath and atones for sin and satisfies satisfies divine justice. Um, and that is the essence of the cross. When we get to this idea, now this is not in my notes, so if if uh, if I chase this rabbit too far, let me know in the comments or Pastor John, you just kick me out of the table. Uh, but so if, if you ever hear anyone say um, in a negative way about this this interpretation of the Lord's Supper, oh, it's are you saying it's just symbolic? Well, no, we're saying it's symbolic, but that doesn't mean it's just symbolic. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit of God, and we believe that God um, blesses uh, the, these means of grace that he's given to the church. When, uh, Pastor, when you're preaching, we shouldn't be sitting there thinking, oh, these are just words. <laughs> no, this is the preaching of God's word that is accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen the church, to edify the church in different ways. And the, and the Lord's Supper uh, the same kind of thing. Baptism in a different way, the same kind of thing. Uh, praying together, singing together, the same kind of thing. The Holy Spirit of the Almighty God is working in and through these things uh, to give spiritual growth wherever it's needed and however it's needed. And we don't know all the mysteries and details of that, um, but but it's true. We believe the Holy Spirit. Is that, good? Is that a good rabbit? I thought that was a good rabbit, and I would just say we very much uh, look forward to celebrating the Lord's Supper when we can assemble Amen. again. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, Exodus 12, just want us to see the importance of bread, the importance of the unleavened bread that was a key element in the Passover. Exodus 12, 8, and I just have to pluck these out of context, well, pluck these out of the context. Uh, but it's the Passover chapter after that final plague was threatened, that tenth plague, and instructions for the Passover are given. Here's what it says in Exodus 12, 8. They shall eat the flesh that night um, of the lambs, Passover lambs, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So bread was a part of the Passover, an important part, unleavened bread. I'll go down to verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove the leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. The unleavened bread, the bread is very important. And two more here, verses 17 and 18. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. There sh therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month 
from the 14th day of the, of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. So for seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened and so on, they'll be cut off. And so the prominence of unleavened bread is giving new meaning at this last Passover. It's giving new meaning um, for moving forward for this uh, church age where the Lord's Supper will be celebrated. And we've already talked about that. This broken bread symbolizes Jesus's death. And it also connects with two other things. So turn to John chapter six, okay? Turn to John six. Uh, this idea of bread being a symbol for Jesus is in continuity with what Jesus taught during his earthly ministry. I'm sure you've heard this. Um, one of the I am statements of Jesus is, I am the, you can fill in the blank, you know where I'm going, bread of life, John 6, 35. And I'd like us to look at John 6, 28 to 35. In, in the Lord's Supper, there's bread that symbolizes Jesus's body. In John 6, as Jesus is teaching, he talks about his body, and that, that is symbolizing, that is pointing to bread, bread from heaven. And so this symbolism of him being bread that needs to be eaten uh, is in direct continuity with some things he taught. John 6, 28, um, this is after the feeding of the 5,000. This is in the middle of a dialogue, if you want to go back and read it. Then they said to him, they said to Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work that you believe in him who he has sent. That's not what they were expecting. They were expecting some sort of outward religious um, uh, ordinances, rituals. Anyway, the work, what you need to do to be saved, to be living for God, is believe in the one he has sent, Jesus Christ. Now, verse 30, so they said to him, Ah, well, then what sign will you do that we may see and believe? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he, significant turn right there, the bread of God is he, that's a personal pronoun. The bread of God is a person. It's he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. And it is a action packed, very convicting, very vivid chapter of scripture. I encourage you to read in your devotions. Um, but eating his flesh and drinking his blood becomes the language of his teaching. And what that symbolizes is believing in him. That's how we partake of Jesus. We believe in him. And by that faith, we receive eternal life, the bread from heaven. Uh, but real quick, and then lobbing it over to you again, Pastor. Um, in that chapter, John 6, he's looking back to two different things simultaneously to interpret their true meaning. He's looking back to what had just happened, the feeding of the 5,000, and talking about the true meaning of that miracle that they should have understood, but they didn't understand. Uh, but it's also looking back to the manna in the wilderness that God gave from heaven. And, and the manna was pointing forward to Christ. And the feeding of the 5,000 was pointing to Christ, the bread of heaven, who was right there in their midst. And because of their hard hearts, they still didn't get it. But, but so there is a grounding. There's a rich biblical background and context for this Lord's Supper that we celebrate. So the idea of <clears throat> eating and drinking being equal to believing, I, I think when we come to the supper today and celebrate it, that's, that's what we are proclaiming. We are proclaiming. Uh, once again, our our faith in the Savior. So not only do we remember what He did for us, we remember that we we trusted that He God drew us to understand that. 
uh, we preach the gospel to ourselves, so to speak, and, and proclaim through the partaking of the supper, through the uh, taking in of the elements, we are proclaiming our faith in Christ. So, so I just think that's the way we can take John 6 personally when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, verse 20. Verse 20, uh, back, back now in Luke 22. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. There was an old covenant, and it was ratified in blood at the foot of Mount Sinai. This is the new covenant, and it is a unique blood, infinitely superior blood, the blood of the precious Lamb, Jesus Christ. This is a new covenant established in and by the blood of Christ. Now, here again, Jesus does not, this is not for Jesus. This is for them. He gives the cup to them. It is poured out for them. This, this cup, he says, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This blood of the covenant is everything. This is what seals the relationship between God and his people. This is what makes possible, but even stronger than that, this is what establishes the relationship, the eternal fellowship between God and believers in Christ, binding them together forever. Now, in the first Passover in Exodus 12, check me on this, check me on this. Uh, there's nothing of a cup. I understand, and you will hear lessons where through Jewish traditions, the cups had become a part of it. And I, I don't want to say anything about that, whether it's wrong or right. I'm just not going to say anything about that. But in Exodus 12, you don't see a cup, but you do see something that's filled with blood. You do see something that's only purpose is to be filled with blood. Go back. I should have told you to put a marker there, but Exodus, I'm sorry for all this flipping. Cross references are fun. <laughs> Cross references are fun. That's right. Exodus 12, 21 and 22. <clears throat> Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans. Okay, it says, Go select lambs. Right. And then there's a comma, and then, this, and then it says this, And kill the Passover lamb. Okay, so now you have slaughtered lamb, Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the the basin. So as they slaughtered the lamb, there was a basin under the sacrifice to gather the blood. The blood came down into the basin, and the basin was taken to the doors. And I don't know how they did it. Maybe you would carry the basin if it's not too heavy for you. And I would have the hyssop, um, and I would dip it in the blood, and we would apply it to the lintel and to the posts uh, to be saved. And it's by the blood of the lamb that we are saved, that that death angel passes over passover but so you have this basin of blood that is and not often talked about but very important uh piece of equipment uh, it's a very important item in the passover to be obedient for it and for it to happen now um at this passover passage that we're looking at in luke you don't hear about the lamb there's no lamb there um, except for Christ, the Lamb of God, capital L. He's the Lamb of God. He's what those, all those Passover lambs in Exodus pointed forward to him. They all symbolized and signified and prefigured him. He's the only one that could provide true salvation and true atonement. And there's a, not a basin, there's a cup. There's a cup that's representing that blood that would have been in the basin that provides redemption. And it doesn't need to be applied um, with hyssop branch on lintel and doorposts. It can only be applied by the Holy Spirit of God into the hearts of dead sinners that we might be redeemed from sin, that our souls might be saved, not from Egypt, but from sin and death. So the blood of Jesus, the true Passover lamb, must be applied to us to be saved. Um, and I do have some more cross references, but Pastor, anything on this uh, blood, uh, lamb, cup, anything? 
the, the blood in scripture uh, represents the life of the sacrifice. So that blood in the basin was the life of that lamb given. The, the blood in the uh, the old covenant uh, sacrifices at the tabernacle and then temple represented the lives of those um, those animals that had come to be substitutes uh, in their in their death. And so when we when we read this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We, we connect that to what that meant in the Old Testament, which had to do with animals being killed and the blood showed that they were killed and my blood, he's going to be killed. And the blood, when we speak about that, is, is speaking about his death for us, his the new covenant is, is his death, the innocent lamb, capital L, is what provides propitiation uh, atonement for us. So I just, I, I think this idea of blood, extremely important in the language of scripture and, in, and should be in our minds, connect it to the death of the sacrifice. And, and so therefore, the new covenant. I love how it is in Matthew. I had turned to that. Let me read it real quick. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. So Jesus said that, and Matthew includes it in his gospel for forgiveness of sins. And I think it's just important to realize the fullness of um, the picture of the old covenant, the fullness of what he did upon the cross, giving an innocent life, shedding his mm -hmm. blood, that we could be forgiven of our sins for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, he didn't die for his sins. That's correct. Certainly didn't die for his sins. So you're saying that the the blood is only worth as much as the life that it came from? Well, that's the, the picture of that is the uh, the animals without blemish, you know, that, that needed to come to the temple. Yeah. And um, so, yes, that there that is true. And so, of course... Um, an infinitely holy son of God, infinite worth. That's the word I was trying to get out of you. I was going to, I was going to keep fishing infinite. This is a sacrifice of infinite value. And um, this is our greatest need. And this is our, this is our need. This is your greatest need. This is my greatest need is this uh, blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ to atone for our sins. This is the only way. This is the only way the offense that the, the um, the offense of our sin against God is an infinite offense because he yeah. is a perfect, holy, infinite being. And, <laughs> and the treachery, the treachery of our sin and, trans, and transgressions is uh, off the scales, off the scales. It's destroyed the scale. So you see the scales. Let's see. Back behind me, Pastor John's um, study here. You'll see Friday night, by the way. <laughs> so, so, um, go. so infinite. It was once for all. That's another Amen. part of this. Amen. And so we celebrate that when we come to the supper. We, we don't remember something that ha we, we're not doing something that has to keep happening. So I want to emphasize that we're looking back at what has happened once mm -hmm. for all, as Hebrew Amen. puts it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, okay. Now, a couple cross references here. First of all, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and and seven. Now, if you ever hear, and you might have heard it before, if not, you probably will sometime in the future, um, when we talk about Christ as the Passover lamb, if you, if you ever hear criticism of that view, or any, anybody that would say that's speculation, that's not really true, Jesus doesn't fulfill that, well, I just want to give you the, the New Testament verse that explicitly refers to Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb. And of course, uh, John the Baptist's preaching that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But this one even goes further. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 7. And I'm reading 6 just because I do want us to see a little bit of the context here because the, the context is, uh, it's an admonition to a local church about the body life of the church. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Paul says this. Uh, your boasting is not good. Your boasting is not good. Now, that's a good principle anytime for anybody. But what he's referring to there is there was there was gross, unrepentant sin in the body there. 
that they were allowing, but even glorying in. And uh, that glorying in what was going on is not good. That boasting is not good. Boasting in sin is never good. Celebrating sin is never good. Uh, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little leaven, they're talking about that leaven of wickedness, that leaven of uh, gross, unrepentant sin in the body. You let it, you let it stay there, it's going to spread and impact that whole lump. It's a good counsel here for local churches to think about this. Here's what he says. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. The old leaven. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the old self that was a slave to sin. The old pagan ways. Cleanse that out that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. So he's referring to the church as the unleavened bread or unleavened lump at least uh, but anyway here's why we came here for christ our passover lamb has been sacrificed yeah. so there you go there's your cross reference christ our passover lamb has been sacrificed and it, the context of why he says that here is intriguing it's because of a lack of repentance and so this seeing christ as the passover lamb and seeing that sacrifice that's what it says christ our passover lamb has been sacrificed was not just to um, attain forgiveness for us but also to sanctify us and make us holy so the cross does cleanse our record of guilt and credit to our record righteousness it takes care of that uh status or that standing that legal standing before god um but the work of the cross and then also the resurrection in both of those sanctifies us and gives us a new heart so that we do not love the old leaven. We do not love sin. We do not glory in sin. We do not shrug our shoulders at sin, but we're sanctified by the blood of the lamb, not just forgiven, but forgiven and sanctified. And I have one more cross reference for this quickly. First uh, Peter one 19. Okay. First Peter one 19. Well, I'll start in 18, okay? 18 and 19. You can't help yourself. I can't. <laughs> I have a two-verse minimum. <laughs> First Peter 1, 18. Knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Same kind of idea here, right? Not just in Corinthians, it was the old leaven. Here, it's now the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. You were ransomed from that. You were redeemed from that. And then he tells us how, or he tells them how. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold. And the kind of, let me just pause there. We know that's true. We know we don't buy our forgiveness, right? We know we don't buy our way to God. We don't buy our way out of sin. It's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you've been ransomed, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. Perfect blood of the lamb and i'll give you these two cross references just for your own devotions um isaiah 52 and 53 uh, picking that up in isaiah 52 um, around 12 or 13 and then that passage continues through uh, isaiah 53 and then um hebrews 8 9 10 uh, we can just say the book of Hebrews, but if you want to, if you want to focus yeah. Hebrews 8, 9, 10, I mean, it's, it's a rich book. If you want to, I mean, you're quarantined. What are you, what are you going to do? <laughs> Read Hebrews, pastor. Yeah. Pray to the Lord to show you the glories and beauties of Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what that, that exists for. Um, so now uh, let's get back to Luke 22. And I want to take us to another cup and I want to introduce it and I want, Pastor, I want you to talk about this also. You've already um, foreshadowed this this part of the conversation. I guess I guess both of us have been alluding to it the whole time, and this is what the Lord's Supper was was alluding to as well. But turn to Luke twenty two and look now this time at verses thirty nine to forty six. This is later that night. This is. Um, his prayer in the garden, agony in the garden. Just 
before his betrayal, but, but another classic scene of this as Passion Week is really ramping up to the climactic events, not just of Christ's life, but of all of history, right? These things are the centerpiece of God's eternal purpose. But Luke 22, 39 to 46, keep your eye out now for another cup, another cup, okay? And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Um, what that means is pray that you don't fall victim. Pray that you don't fall victim to temptation. Okay. Verse 41, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And we don't have time to do a study on this cup tonight, but I figured it was uh, it would be important for us to at least mention the significance of this cup because the cup that he is holding, if you look at your cross references and look up the Old Testament um, background to this, the cup that he's holding is a cup full of foaming wrath from God for the sins of all his people from all ages, Jews who would believe, Gentiles who would believe, um, all of God's wrath for all of their sin in a cup. And that is what is hanging over his head and bringing Jesus to, to this spiritual agony that my words can never describe. But that's what he's experiencing and crying out, in prayer and um, ex spiritual exhaustion here collapsed on the ground this cup that he's going to drink for his people yeah so as i shared uh, this past sunday night uh, in that um, steps to the cross uh, scripture reading um, it, it's the wrath of god that he is struggling with in the garden of gethsemane and so that's exactly what this cup is every other time in christ's life he does the will of the father in perfect fellowship with the father but not in those hours on the cross he's doing the will of god i don't mean that but but he's doing them in a different way the father's wrath is upon him and so that fellowship that he knew was gone. What he's experiencing is wrath, hell, uh, is what it ultimately will be for the unbeliever, separation from God in a place of torment, a place of, of misery. Uh, what it was for him on the cross, I guess we would always say is a mystery, but we see the depth of it, I think, here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you're outside of Christ tonight, uh, it's a perfect opportunity to, to say something to you in terms of the cup of God's wrath and uh, doesn't make me happy to say this. I mean, I tremble to say this, but if you're not in Christ, you still carry your cup Yeah, and you could drink it any appointed time. You don't know. You could drink it tonight. You could drink it next week. Come to Christ, come to Christ. There's not a drop of judgment left in the cup that he drank on yeah, the cross. It is finished. It is finished. Is this cry. Um, so real, uh, I keep saying real quick, but, um, Real quick, I want to connect the two cups. The cup that at the at the um, Last Supper he gave to them, right? But this cup, this cup, he's taking from them. Yeah. And yeah. and seeing the connection between those two, because the first cup at the Lord's Supper is symbolizing I, I'm doing something for you. I'm providing something for you. But the second cup is takes it to another level and explains why that matters uh, yeah. because there it's doing something in your place. Yeah. Ah, 
That's why the cup of his blood um, that he distributes um, takes care of our sin because he takes care of the judgment by taking that cup from us. It's a, it's a cup trade. Is that too frivolous of a way to say it? I mean, it's, it's a swap. It is a swap. The gospel is a swap. The work of the cross is a swap. He dies for our sins so that we might receive his righteousness and his life um, and, and eternal life. So he's not only dying for his people, he's dying in the place of his people. And by faith, that could be you. That could be you tonight if you come to Christ by faith. Um, two verses, I'll just read these and make a brief point. Uh, this was our original passage that we didn't uh, didn't finish. Verse 21 to 23, three verses. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that. You know that word determined? It's always popping up in the New Testament. And the point is God planned all this out from the, before the foundation of the world. This, the, the, this is all arising from the wisdom and will of God for his glory. Always plan A. Always plan A. <laughs> hey, that would be another great book for you to write. So I've got several coming. <laughs> fit for glory. I can't get that one out of my head. Fit for glory. You better write these down. Yeah, fit for glory. And then what did you say? Always plan A. Always plan A. Always plan A. And then what was the other one? You had another one the yeah. same night we talked about Fit for Glory. We'll figure it out. It's on record. It's on the live streams. <laughs> Verse, uh, and then he says, and, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which, which one it would be who's going to do this. So uh, Judas is not off the hook because all of this was determined. He is guilty, and it's just like in the Joseph narrative at the end of Genesis, that last portion. Um, his brothers are not off the hook for their sin and their treachery. That was real. No, They're guilty. Yeah, it, it, I love how in verse 21, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility sits side by side. The hand of him who betrays me, and it's going to go as it has been determined. So... Uh, both and as we read the scripture, God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. We see that in, in Judas. Yeah. In yeah. Betrayal. That's a good word, brother. And we don't, we don't take those two doctrines that are clear in scripture and pit them against one another, no. like some sort of box, boxing match. If there's mystery there, we bow down and worship and humble ourselves before God. We don't, um, which is what Paul does at the end of yeah. Romans 11. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Good cross -reference. That's another good homework cross reference. Romans 11, 33 through 36. Whole chapter. Whole chapter. <laughs> it's always a safe, uh, safe out. Um, I'll say a closing word and then let you get the last word and, and close us in prayer and, and the okay. announcements. Uh, my closing word is look to Jesus Christ. If you are outside of Christ this evening, look to him in faith <laughs> and be saved. Turn to him in repentance and faith and be saved salvation from sins uh, salvation from eternal judgment uh, receive eternal life in christ uh, but if you are already saved my encouragement to you starts the same way look to christ look to christ in faith to grow in your faith to be strengthened in your faith to be more fruitful in holiness uh, for perseverance for sanctification we don't come to christ by faith and then move on to uh, so-called more relevant or practical things. So whoever you are, wherever you are, lost, saved, my message uh, t t tonight is look to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Yeah, amen to that. And feel free to contact us. We would love to have a conversation through email or uh, in, through the phone. Uh, the phone number of the church, 410-836-6994, if it rings tonight. Uh, we'll be here a few minutes afterwards. We'll pick it up. My email, pastor.manry at gmail.com. And if they want to contact you, what do they do? Pastor Matt at northharford.org. Or just okay. message me. I, I'm always on our Facebook uh, thing here. So you can just, yeah, use just, message just me. want you to know that we, we would love to, to have a conversation with you about any spiritual question you might have. Uh, Friday night, 6 o'clock, um, 
as we look at what's so good about Good Friday, answering that question from the book of Romans particularly, but I'm sure we'll have some cross-references because they are fun. And then... Hey, man, it's the most important day in the history of the world. The yes. day Jesus died, that's what we'll be celebrating. So. We, we, we'll look forward to that and try to think of questions that help with that major question of what's so good about it. And then don't forget Easter Sunday. I mean, I wish we could assemble. We can't, but we will be joining together online, Facebook Live at 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to return to the series on Corinthians that <laughs> Pastor Matt kind of never left. <laughs> But we're going to go to the first part of chapter 15, and, and our Easter message will come from the first 11 verses. We look forward to that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the richness of this text and uh, all that we've looked at here. Uh, thank you for the diff different directions we went. Uh, ultimately, we thank you that you so love the world that you sent your son and decided to do that uh, before you created the world. Amazing to us. Uh, so we see, yes, your holiness that requires a judgment for sin. We see that cup of wrath and we see your love and mercy to send the lamb who would drink that cup upon the cross. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye. Thanks for joining us. We love you. All right. See you Friday night.